glad in May. Let us rejoice and be glad in May. We are a pilgrim people. our voices in covenant, let us also pray together in confession. Holy One, in a world of plenty we have hoarded our earthly blessings rather than storing up our heavenly treasure. Friends, we are forgiven. Let us offer grace to one another. Not just grace also, but the peace of our Lord who said, My peace I live with you. Turn to your neighbor, find someone you don't know, and say, May the peace of Christ be with you.
that spirit where all are gathered in the name of love that we are invited into this place and that we go forth from this place. As you know, probably better than I, we like to give you a lot of information in the church, especially in this church. We know many things. And so the many things that we know, we like to print and use words. We tell that story in your bulletin. There are many pages at the end of your bulletin where you can find out about people's joys and concerns. And you might have a joy or concern yourself that you would like printed there the next week. You can always contact our office. Now, there's important information about what's happening in the life of this community, not only in First Plymouth, but at large, and how we can continue to share God's love and reach out and be informed by participating in the life of this community. So please take that bulletin home, put it on your refrigerator, or recycle it, which is also fine, um, and, and read it and find out about how you can get involved in the life of this church. I want to welcome each of you from all ages and let you know that we do have a nursery. You can bring your children even as early as 9.30. There is a welcome and wonderful space for them. We include children and teens and all ages in our worship. So know that no matter who you are, that means from the youngest to the most wise among us, you are welcome in this space, no matter where you are on, on life's journey. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let us continue our worship by quieting our souls, by bringing our celebrations, our fears, and knowing that God definitely meets us in this place. At this time, we want to invite our children to come forward right here on this front row of chairs or gather here on the floor beside me with Miss Alex. So come on down, children. Yeah. Oh, cool. So that's 
that would be kind of sad, huh? Yeah. So I want to, next I'm going to read a poem to you guys. We, we've imagined, and now I'm going to read a poem to you. And it's a poem about uh, a man who had a special wish. And the poem is called Lester, and it's from a book called Where the Sidewalk Ends. No, it's called Lester. <laughs> Lester was given a magic wish by the goblin who lived in the banyan tree. And with his wish, he wished for two more wishes. So now instead of just one wish, he had three. With each of these, he simply wished for three more wishes, which gave him three old wishes plus nine new. And with each of these 12, he slyly wished for three more wishes, which added up to 46, or is it 52? Well, anyway, he used each wish to wish for wishes till he had five billion seven million eighteen thousand thirty-four. And then he spread them on the ground, clapped his hands, and danced around, and skipped and sang, and then sat down and wished for more. And more and more they multiplied, while other people smiled and cried and loved and reached and touched and felt. Lester sat amidst his wealth, stacked mountain high like stacks of gold, sat and counted and then grew old. And then on Thursday night they found him dead with his wishes piled around him. And they counted a lot and found that not a single one was missing. All shiny and new. Here, take a few. And think of Lester as you do. In a world of apples and kisses and chews, he wasted his wishes on you too. Well, thank you guys for coming up. We have two tables over there full of a bunch of things to color if you guys want to go sit over there or you can go sit with your family. <laughs>
follow the words of Scripture. They're on page 5. We will start with a lesson from Paul's letter to the Colossians. We will pick up this thread in chapter 3. So, if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. These are the ways you also once followed when you were living that life. But now you must get rid of all such things. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourselves with the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. In that renewal, there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. Go back to the Gospel, the 12th chapter of Luke. There was a crowd. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbiter over you? And he said to him, Take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly, and he thought to himself, What should I do, for I have no place to store my crops? And then he said, I'll do this. I will pull down my barns, build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. God said to him, You fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. The word of God. together. Holy God, we lift up to you the names of those in El Paso, in Dayton, Ohio, the victims, the survivors, the first responders, the family members of those who have lost their lives from violence. God, pour out your presence, surround them with love, and call the church to be the church. Go before us and behind us, hem us in on all sides. Holy One, we know that no human actions or words can ever fully testify to the magnitude of your grace, to the abundance of your love. But may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts gathered here this morning be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. No one, not one, ever did say that the success of a pastor's tenure would be to talk about money in the first 30 days of their pastorate. <laughs> 
And so we have Luke, the 12th chapter, and this rich fool. The rejected must lead the revival of love and justice, William Barber pronounced. In the opening statement of his keynote sermon, preached during the closing worship of the Disciples' General Assembly a few weeks ago. His prophetic voice and presence loomed largely behind the pulpit and shuddered through the vast hall, leaving only an air of hope and anticipation for what would come next. And a little bit of fear, a little bit of fear, the fear of deep truth recoiling in our innards as the power of bold and honest proclamation unsettled even the purest among them. Sing, Bible. Talk to us today, he preached. The rejected must lead the revival of love and justice. Now, I don't know about you, but I think a revival in true form is what we need today. Amen? A revival of love and justice. He spoke from two texts primarily. Psalm 118. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And from Jesus' first sermon in Nazareth. Luke chapter 4. A brown-skinned Palestinian Jew standing in the ghetto proclaiming good news to the Poe people, said Barber. Not the poor. The Poe people. God has sent me to bring good news to the poor, claimed Jesus. Sight for the blind, freedom to the captive. Barber quoted from Clarence Jordan's Cotton Patch Gospel, and he added, to bring dignity to those who have not, to bring dignity to those who it has been stripped from. To bring dignity. The Bible, Barber said, does not invite us into some otherworldly journey, right? We so often think of churchy words or prayers or the spiritual life as otherworldly. Those who walk in the clouds and use words that we really don't understand, right? No, he cried. We are called to a movement for wholeness. In a broken world. Now, a movement is not a solo journey. Amen? And I think we could all get on our soapboxes about what is broken in this world. In America's long story, Barber said to the assembly, we have had a lot of stones that have been rejected. Hate is not new, he preached. Injustice from the highest places in our government and theologically endorsed practices is not new. There is not some pristine past behind us. Policy, violence, and rejection have too often been our legacy. Sometimes in spite of this calling, the legacy has even been endorsed by the institution of church. No? And all of God's people said, Forgive us, O oh God. Forgive us. Have mercy upon us, O oh God. Forgive us, we pray. Church, what is our legacy? Think about that for a moment. What is this church's legacy as you know it or see it to be? What is the wider church's legacy? What story are we telling to past and future and present? generations. What story are we telling? Think about it. Think about it down in your gut, where it hurts just a little bit. Think about it. Our nation is still caught up in kingdom life, ambiguous to the nature of God's call upon the church, still led to the Caesars and saviors of the day, of the hour, somehow still holding up the oppressive structures of a bygone era while decimating the earth beneath our feet, decimating God's creation 
and created ones. Tradition trumps compassion. Old and oppressive forms hold hostage the radical, radical, radical message of God's inclusive love to a people somehow caught in the middle between the firestorm of religiosity, of racism, of systemic injustice. What, battling out, dueling for the last word, the last dollar, the last ounce of human dignity and decency? What story are we telling, First Plymouth Congregational Church? What story? We began worship this morning by calling our spirits to commune with the spirit of the living God. We called one another pilgrims on this journey. Now, pilgrims travel together, yes? Pilgrims. And we called ourselves to rejoice in this day, this day, the day that God has made, where many have lost their lives to gun violence on this day that God has made. And then we sang, we raised our voices, sang the mighty power of God. Friends, we cannot honestly gather in this sacred space, claiming to walk the sacred journey, calling upon the living, breathing love and power of God, if we do not also claim heresy that exists at every level of our institutional and social lives. At every level. But church, we are called to tell a different story. To tear down kingdoms while building up the kingdom, K-I-N-D-O-N, the kingdom of God. Amen. Kingdom looks like pilgrims, family on a journey traveling together. Well, in Luke 12, Jesus gives us a hint at this kingdom building. This time in a crowd much like this, but maybe a little bit more rambunctious. A crowd so large, they're trampling on each other. Let's get to trampling, people. They're so excited about what Jesus is going to say that they're trampling on each other. And from the crowd, we hear a voice, a voice saying, hey, you, preacher. Yeah, you, you. Hey, tell my brother to give me what's mine. Where's mine? I want my inheritance. Sound familiar? Anyone? You know? To which Jesus responds, fresh out of love, brother. I'm not your judge. But then he looks at the crowd, this crowd equally scrambling for theirs. He looks at the crowd and he says, don't be greedy. Don't be greedy. Life is not defined by what you have, even when you have a lot. Even when you have a lot. Friends, I have a lot. My room with all those toys, my house with all those toys. Shannon, we have a lot of toys and other things, right? Who has a lot? Anyone have a lot? Each of us in this room has a lot relative to those who have not. We have a lot. Jesus proceeds telling the story of the barn guy. You know the one. He looks like Scott. You know, sturdy, strong enough to build that extra barn. He's got a lot, right? He decides to hoard his wealth by building bigger barns. And then making me, myself, and I the beneficiary of his own wealth, right? He builds that bigger barn. Jesus then compares this rich fool to the birds of the air and the lilies of the field. We live in Colorado, folks. Look at the birds of the air, the fresh lilies in the field. Does God not care for them? Do they not live freely? Do they not sing and grow? Are they not living in splendor? Jesus says to the crowd, stop being so scared, church, little flock. Stop being so scared. God has made you responsible for the movement. God has made you, church, responsible for the movement. Luke 4, Isaiah 61. The spirit of the Lord is upon me to bring good news to the poor. Sight for the blind, freedom to the captive, not to an individual, but to the nations, to the poor. A movement for love and justice. A movement is not a solo journey, friends. 
Verse 21 in the Greek can be interpreted in two ways, meaning either spiritual abundance, right? The riches, spiritual abundance, or literal material wealth, like your kid's room spilling out with toys, or maybe like my kid's room. Jesus says, sell what you have and give it to the poor. Give it to the po. Give it to the poor. Make yourselves wallets. This is really important. Make yourselves wallets that won't wear out. I have a lot of purses. Anyone? <laughs> and, you know, they don't have enough time to wear out. I have too many. One can't wear out because I have so much. Obviously, spiritual wealth and literal wealth are not mutually exclusive. But the relationship is complicated, isn't it? It's complicated. We have a lot, but we need more. Mita Stamper notes that references to the rich in the Gospels are almost uniformly negative and almost always contrasted with positive references to the poor throughout the entirety of Scripture. God sends the rich away empty in Mary's prophetic poetry, and they have a woe on them in the Beatitudes where the poor are given the kingdom of God. Abraham says, if, if they haven't listened to Moses and the prophets, they won't be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. And finally, the very rich ruler seeking the way to eternal life lacks only one thing. That he sell his possessions and give the money to the poor. And that appears to be the one thing he cannot do. It is nearly impossible for the rich to enter the kingdom of God, Jesus concludes. But he ends this episode on a hopeful note. And here is the power of God, of which we sing. He says, for the mortal, things are impossible. But for God, all things are possible. Amen? Amen. This is the story of the church. Faith. Right? Faith. Faith is the belief in things unseen. Hope in the impossible. For Romans 14, Abraham became the father of many nations because he believed in a God who gives life to the dead. A God who brings into existence things that did not exist. Amen, church? This is the story of the church. Dignity, love, and wholeness to those who are cast aside. God brings into existence things that did not exist. The poor, the broken, the marginalized, immigrants, widows, children, women, black and brown skinned brothers and sisters, Jewish, Palestinian Jews. Leading the way, the rejected must lead the revival of love and justice. The capstone is the centerpiece that holds the ancient buildings together, said Barber. How we view humans in society, it's God's intent that the stones, the poor, the broken, the marginalized, that were once seen to be unfit to be part of the architecture, the stones that were once thrown away or kept in the quarry, now have been called to be the chief cornerstones. Part of William Barber's call upon this nation, if you've heard it, that sets the poor people's campaign apart from other movements is his insistence that those directly affected by systemic injustice lead the way. Last summer, a friend and colleague of mine, the Reverend Dr. Nancy Petty from Pullen Memorial in Raleigh, North Carolina, she's the, the board chair for Repairs of the Breach, Dr. Barber's nonprofit organization. She called me and asked me to join her and William Barber and some others, because we were launching a new Poor People's Campaign. So I drove to Charlotte. As we gathered in the makeshift storefront church, led by Bishop Tanya Rawls, the room quieted upon his entrance. Wearing black sweatpants and a hoodie, hobbling on a cane, came the frail and vulnerable giant in the faith. I didn't know if I should say hi or just sit there. I'd met him many times, but this time was very different. Propped up on a wobbly stool in the middle of our semicircle, he asked us to introduce ourselves to the group by sharing our relationship with poverty. 
There were about 20 of us in the room. First of all, I wanted to crawl under the table as I sat overdressed, unaware, and unprepared for the significance of this moment. So I leaned over and whispered to Nancy, should I say anything about my own childhood? I mean, we were far from rich. She cut me off and gave me a sharp no. We are allies in this fight. This is not our fight, just listen. Oh, took a deep breath. I sat there puzzled, struggling, and honestly sweating as one by one this family, brought together by blood and sweat and tears and more blood and death, shared about how poverty, the poverty they had endured, how systemic racism and oppression had torn their lives and their families' lives apart. Generation to generation. My own modest upbringing, my penniless TV dinners from grad school, didn't deserve a chair in the room. Didn't deserve to breathe the same air, and yet I was invited. I was invited to be part of this circle. And you know what? It was up to me to figure out from that point on what my relationship with poverty was going to be. It is up to us, church, to decide what our relationship with those who suffer injustice and oppression and discrimination and violence is going to be. What is it going to be, church? It is up to us to bring good news to the poor, sight for the blind, and freedom to the captive. What about me? Hey, preacher, what about me? Calls a voice from the crowd. How will I get what's mine? I'm ready to put my feet up, get a drink, eat, drink, and be merry. Hello? Hello? Right? But Jesus doesn't ridicule this man for his wealth, for having an inheritance, or for seeking to work it out with his brother. He cautions him, and then he offers him the keys to the kingdom. an alternative reality, a new way in which to live his life. He says, great, put your feet up, pour a drink, pour me one while you're at it, but do not forget your wounded and struggling neighbor. Blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are the poor, Lift up the weak, support the broken, rise and follow, and this is so important, rise and follow the rejected stones. Because Jesus said, God has made you responsible for the movement, church. You have been given much, and so much is expected. Church, what is our legacy? What is our story? We must take our place in the movement of faith in this upside-down world. If we are to be a leading community of faith in the 21st century, proclaiming good news to the poor, sight to the blind, and freedom to the captive, we must listen to those leading the way, to women of color who will not back down, to black and brown-skinned voices, teachers, preachers, leaders, activists, to children and teenagers who are already calling us to listen for their lives. No more guns, no more fossil fuels, no more death. No more, they are calling us. No more camps, no more. We must listen and we must put our riches in their hands. We must follow the way of the rejected stones who God is raising up who is lifting their voices to lead the way. Those who have experienced injustice, those whom God has called, must lead the revival of love and justice. Amen? Let us be the church this day and every day. Amen.
be seated. A brief word of explanation to any visitors who are here. In just a moment, we will pass the traditional offering plates and you'll have a chance to make a gift at that time. What our church has done for the last several years is find organizations that are doing good work, uh, fighting injustice, fighting poverty, fighting uh, environmental degradation, all the things that we believe in. Uh, and we call this our Share the Plate. Our Share the Plate recipients uh, in, for the month of August, the outreach ministry has nominated a new dimension of hope. And we would like to hear uh, from two other people right now about the work that they're doing in uh, West Africa. I'd invite to the front Monica Labish Brown, who's on their advisory board, and Ebenezer Norman, if you would uh, join us and say a word about um, a new dimension of hope in the work that you're doing in Liberia. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I am Monica Labish Brown, and this is Ebenezer Norman. And Ebenezer is the founder and executive director of the organization. And so if you're wondering why am I here, <laughs> when he could be talking about his organizations, it's really because Norman has a passion for his work but he very seldom talks about it. And so I have volunteered to come here and speak on his behalf. So Norman uh, is from Liberia. And in these recent days when we've been seeing a lot of violence, I was thinking about what I was going to say today. And I'm reminded that people like Norman, who is from Liberia, has seen violence on an ongoing basis. Because in Liberia, there was violence for nine years, civil war where people, almost 250 people lost their lives. So with this background, when Norman came to the United States, he decided that he was going to give back. And he started a school. Would you like to say something about that? Sure. So in 2015, I, um, I um, decided that I, I would dedicate the rest of my life um, to going back and, and helping change the lives of children that grew up in the same situation I grew up in. I've been very blessed to live in this country. Every morning, every morning I wake up, I hear the swish, the light comes on. And for the first part of my life, there was no swish. Um, I, and and, um, and so when I went back, I built my first school for 102 kids. Um, one year after, the government demolished it. It got demolished. Um, I was so broken, and I, I turned to God, and I said, God, how can you put this dream in my heart? I fought so hard to, to build a first school, and it got demolished, you know? And I went in withdrawal for some time. And, Recently, I just built the second school, but this time, God gave me the strength, and I rebuilt the second school for this time for a 1,000 children. So 10 times bigger than the first one. Um. <laughs> so with this school, um, the first school Norman started, he got donations from people, and um, started the school, and like he said, it was torn down. Second time around, he started Ubering. Um, Norman has done 62,000 miles in one year. And with the monies, actually he came to find out about this church tr through somebody who was a passenger in his vehicle. <laughs> and um, with that, he has saved money and he built this new larger school. However, as most nonprofits would know, that is not a sustainable model, and that he would need to get donations from foundations and from churches and from individuals uh, to make sure that the school is running. At this time, Norman needs $80,000 to start the to run the school, which launches in September, but. To start the school initially, in September, he needs $20,000. So far, he's raised a little over 
$10,000 and needs another $9,000 by September to support him to pay for the teacher's salaries, to pay for computers, to pay for just the things that you need to run a school. And actually, $80,000 is not a lot of money to run a school that will teach 1,000 students. So Norman is here asking for your support, for the support of friends like you who can help students in Maymay Town, in Liberia, get an education so that they can work themselves out of poverty. Thank you. Thank you, Monica and Ebenezer. Would you please join with me in reading together our prayer of dedication? Loving God, we share what we have because you share so abundantly with us. May our sharing be an act of thanksgiving and praise for all you have done and all you will continue to do for us. We dedicate these gifts and offer ourselves to your service. Bless us and our gifts that we might be a source of help, hope, and joy to a world in need. With grateful hearts, we pray. Amen. Our morning offering will now be given and received.
friends, let us now join in the invitation to the table. This is the joyful feast of the people of God. Men and women, youth and children, come from the east and the west, the north and the south, and gather about Christ's table. This table is for all who wish to know the presence of Christ and to share in the community of God's people. Everyone is welcome at Christ's table. Please be seated. Let us pray. God, you called the heavens and the earth out of the deep emptiness of chaos. Soft breezes caressing our cheeks, songbirds caroling your glory, children tap dancing through mud puddles. All that we see, hear, and feel has sprung from your imagination. Creating God, all that you thought, dreamed, and wondered was shaped for us, that we might live with you in peace and hope. But we wondered what we would do with your glory and power. We dreamed of being divine and thought we were equal, so we reached out for wealth and power, those false idols who enticed us, even as they ensnared us with their lies. You sent the prophets to remind us of your vision for us, and to assure us of your hope. We took no delight in their words. Then your word took on flesh and came to us as Jesus, the teacher who loved and taught to summon us out of the empty lives we have created for ourselves. And therefore, as we gather as your faithful ones in this time, in this place, rejoicing in the presence of your spirit, we remember that it is not our words which save us, but your imaginative, creative love of beauty, remembering that it is not our achievements, but our hope in Jesus, our hope in love, which assures us of your love. And we celebrate the mystery we call faith. God of gentleness, pour out your spirit of grace and peace upon these, your simple gifts which become life for us, the cup of the new covenant bread that endures as we taste the goodness of grace, heal our brokenness. May our eyes be opened to the oppression and injustices the world would keep us from seeing. As the rich wine of hope and joy refreshes our hearts and souls, may we be ready to share all that we have been given, to speak up for the voiceless, to gather the lost into our family. And when all time has stopped moving and all the faithful have been gathered, when we sit down at the feast prepared for all, we will join hands to sing the eternal anthem of your vision of hope and peace for all creation, proclaiming forever and ever your glory, your love, God in community, lover, teacher, creator, sustainer. And we do so remembering Jesus who taught, who loved, who is for us the very point, the very guide, the very direction on this life that leads us to you. And we, we remember that as Jesus gathered in a room, much not like this one, smaller, more damp, more crowded, he took bread at supper and looking around the room into the eyes of his friends, the teachers, those who would follow, those who would deny him and the very way of love. He looked and he broke the bread, saying, take and eat this covenant, this brokenness that might heal and feed. It's for all people that we might come together to be fed and to feed. In the same way, sharing the cup, Jesus sat in the room and looked around and thirst was in the air and he offered the cup of the new covenant, pouring it out for the grace of all, that all might come to know the fullness, the abundance of God's love. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God from which we are fed and by which we might feed the world. Come to the table for all things are prepared. At First Plymouth Congregational Church, we take communion by intinction which means that as I call forward the servers who will come forward now to prepare the gifts, you can also prepare yourselves to come forward. Simply follow the server who will dismiss the aisles, come forward and return 
and the other aisle to your seats. Let us now take these gifts of God.
Friends, the rejected stones must lead the way of love and justice. And we, church, must follow. We must put our riches, our spiritual and material abundance into their hands. Because guess what? God is calling them, raising them up to lead the way. Let us, church, be the church and follow the way of love and justice. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Amen.